Welcome to a special edition of Meet the Bloggers. I am your host, Cenk Uger. We are doing this special edition because we're in the midst of what we are told is an unprecedented financial crisis that requires a trillion dollars of taxpayer money. That's your money, my money, and we are told uh, that we, this is absolutely necessary and we want to find out if it is. And the person who's going to help us do that is Nancy Pelosi. She's the Speaker of the House and we couldn't ask for a better guest today. We really appreciate you joining us, Speaker Pelosi. Thank you very much, Jenny. Nice to be with you. Uh, it, it's great to have you here. We just got word, Speaker Pelosi, that President Bush is going to speak to the nation tonight. Uh, what do you think he's going to say? I haven't the faintest idea. I hope he will apologize to the American people for the failure of his economic policies. Uh, this uh, anything goes uh, free, so-called free economy with uh, no supervision, no regulation has taken us to this place. And now he's coming back and saying, because of the high flyers on Wall Street, the taxpayers are going to have to pay the price. I, I, I think he owes the American people an apology and explanation. He needs to tell us why this is necessary, A, and B, why he thinks this approach will work. Well, that's exactly it, uh, Speaker Pelosi, and that's what I'm concerned about. They tell us, as they've always told us, right before an election, we've got an emergency, it's an imminent worldwide crisis, we have to act right now, you don't have time to think, just sign on to our plan. But what assurances do we have that this will be effective and that, in fact, that it's even necessary? Well, the fact it is necessary, I think all of the uh, uh, experts on the subject will tell you that there is a necessity to intervene uh, because the crisis that has gotten to this point. Why it took them so long to come to Congress to say uh, a true evaluation of the economic uh, state of our country is beyond me. Why they thought that they could just uh, airdrop this thing into the Congress and expect everyone to say okay is beyond me. But the fact is that we are in a situation where we need to stabilize the markets. We've got to figure out the best way to go forward. And we've got, to, in doing so, as we stabilize the markets, we have to protect the taxpayer have some forbearance for homeowners, have very serious oversight on how we go forward, and have some upside for the, for the taxpayer, for the American people. If we're going to put this money out, what do we get in return for it? It's, they call it an investment. We want to know what the return on the investment is. I don't think there's any question that there's a need for an intervention, unfortunately. Uh, but again, why they think this particular intervention will work, why it's so costly, and um, uh, why they didn't tell us sooner. Well, I guess that's after the fact now, but uh, as we go forward, uh, we need to assure the American people that this is the right way to go. Well, they're asking for an well, extraordinary asking for request. request. It's $700 billion. For that kind of extraordinary request, you would think that they have, would have extraordinary evidence that we're on the brink. Uh, no one doubts that we have a problem. There's no question about that. The question is, how big is the problem, and is this the right solution? And have they really brought evidence to bear to tell us that Hank Paulson's solution is the right one? And the more important question well, the, is, the, because the, you're going to make a decision on it, is have you bought into Hank Paulson's decision on how to handle this? Well, let me, let me start with first. First of all, uh, we're concerned about insulating Main Street and everyday Americans from the crisis on Wall Street. And whatever solution they advance, the, this is their problem. This is their solution, and um, if, if everyone agrees that there has to be, uh, we must intervene. We want to do so in a way that has other principles about protecting the taxpayer, the homeowner, uh, some equity for, uh, for our investment, as well as a massive oversight so this never happens again. The, the, um, uh, the uh, many of the experts tell us that this will have an impact on the lives of everyday Americans in terms of their jobs, their savings, their access to credit, small businesses' access to credit. It's just a tragedy, uh, and a tragedy that they must have known was coming, and they were very late in coming to Congress on. Uh, the, what they, you know, we, we've been listening to everyone on this subject intensely the last, um, for a while now, when Lehman went down and AIG was um, rescued, uh, to see what would work. And uh, it's generally thought that there are several approaches that could be taken. This is one of them, which will inject funds into uh, these um, uh, failed institutions, buying, if not, they're not failed institutions, but uh, by the liquid paper, the bad paper of some of these institutions that could go down because of this failed, um, uh, this uh, bad paper. Uh, and, and, uh, and so this is one approach that could attract 
private sector money, the re reducing the need for us to put in as that much money, the $700 billion. That's more a, a number that we hope we never have to put in. Uh, but if we do, we hope to get it back, plus, um, plus more than interest for the taxpayer. Right, Again, so it has an impact on everyday Americans. That's why we're interested in it, and, uh, and that's why we have to do something about it. All right, Speaker Pelosi, then let's get into the details of what you need uh, for this deal to go through. Uh, if there is no capping of executive compensation here, are you going to say no deal to this? Is there any way that this deal passes without executive compensation being limited? That's a shame. I believe we have... Okay. Are we live on the Internet right now? That's awesome. Hey, guys, how are you? We've lost Speaker Pelosi for a second, but we're going to get her right back because we've got a lot more questions, and we want to... Yeah, it's, you know, that's interesting. Uh, somebody just told me from the control room that in our live blog, 93% of you guys don't support the bailout. And look, I've been fuming about it since the day it was announced on Friday. I don't support the bailout. So the problem is, and you know, I've asked these questions already to Speaker Pelosi. I'm going to move on to the details when we get her back on the air. But you come and ask me for $700 billion, you better have excellent evidence that it's absolutely necessary. Now there are some top-line economists in the country who are saying that it is not necessary. Not, not that we don't need to do anything, but one, is Hank Paulson's uh, plan necessary? Uh, most people are unconvinced of that. Two, whether there needs to be any bailout in specific, uh, a lot of people are unconvinced about. But, but now we have Speaker Pelosi back on, and I want to talk about the specifics of that bailout. I was asking you, Speaker Pelosi, uh, if there is no limit on executive compensation, are the House Democrats going to say no deal? Well, what we have told them, and I don't think that this is, uh, I think this is the wish of the American people, not just the House Democrats. Uh, that there should uh, there are four major principles. Uh, one is uh, oversight, uh, very very strong independent oversight is necessary. Uh, limits on executive uh, compensation. The American people are clamoring for that. It is the right thing to do, and uh, we have to be successful in that regard. Uh, the third is the uh, making sure that any profits that come from this uh, are, are for the benefit of the U.S. taxpayer and to have some forbearance so that we can have uh, help people stay in their homes. Uh, the, most, the, the issue that the American people understand better than any other is the executive compensation. I can't see how the administration can walk away from that. Uh, but we have more than that as uh, some of the uh, changes that we'd like to see uh, in this package. Speaker Pelosi, in that point number three that you just mentioned, does that mean equity? Do we get an equity stake in these companies? Or is there another way of making sure that they don't turn around next year after we take all their toxic assets and turn a huge profit? Well, it, that's part of it. The, the, there are a couple ways to go about it. Uh, first of all, I, I heard you asking at one point what was in the pack. What, the, what they are proposing is, 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 is buying the illiquid commercial and uh, uh, residential paper that is in, uh, in these institutions uh, to create a market for them where we could make a profit by holding the assets and selling them later, but also by buying them and attracting the private sector to also buy that paper since a price has been established for them. Uh, at the same time, if we're making these institutions healthier by, as Secretary Paulson says, unclogging their artery, arteries of this illiquid paper, if those companies are going to become uh, healthy, then uh, we should have warrants uh, for some equity there so that the American people get the upside. We not only take the risk, we not only clear the paper, uh, but we get some upside. And there's some suggestions that any upside that we get should be used uh, to reduce the, the national debt, uh, that in any event the money should come back to the, the, the American people and not go to the Secretary of the Treasury as their legislation initially proposed if you can imagine that. Speaker so, Pelosi, uh, I'm sorry, I, I wanted to ask have, also... Others have suggested that we take even a stronger equity position in addition to the warrants associated with the, um, with the buying the paper, but just have the opportunity to have a stronger equity position, and that's under discussion. And, and is that a deal breaker, that if you don't get equity or you don't uh, 
get to a point where we could take some of the profits rather than having them all dump their toxic assets on us and take the profits next year. Uh, is that a deal breaker for you guys? But with, here's my point. We have bigger issue. You know, we have a big, first the big issue is, is this going to work? And how much money should be committed to it? And for what period of time? Some of these other issues are essentials that we have. I don't anticipate that we will have a problem with them. You know, I, I just, they're just, to me, in my view, quite easy uh, for them to do. But again, our bigger issues are, can this work? Why so much money? Uh, what's the timetable? Can't we do it? in a different time frame with a different amount of money. Speaker Pelosi, how about what kind of loans get uh, put into this package? Originally, we started talking about mortgages, but I've now read in several accounts that we're talking about all bad loans, a lot of toxic assets yeah. that are not related to mortgages. Can we make sure that those loans don't get put into this package? Well, I, I, we ha I, I know that you've heard that, and that we haven't had an explanation on that, but one of the things that we want to make sure is not in this is um, uh, student loans, because they're not toxic. They're loans that the government uh, pays for anyway. You know, that is to say, those loans are granted directly from Treasury. These banks just make the loan, and they go to the Treasury uh, to get their money back. So that's not toxic, so that shouldn't count on anybody's books. So we have to take a careful look at what they are calling, but their original proposal was residential and, and commercial mortgages. Absolutely. Otherwise, it's going to be a huge garbage dump right in the uh, taxpayer's lap. It's unacceptable to take all their bad loans and all their mistakes off their hands. Now, one of the other things that uh, is a cause of concern is right now the right-wing blogosphere is starting to call this the Bush-Pelosi bailout plan. Right. Well, and they are suggesting that the Republicans uh, not vote for it, that they're going to stick you with this proposal. Uh, is there any way that you accept this deal if the House Republicans and the Senate Republicans don't go along? Absolutely not. This is their problem. They created it with their anything goes, uh, uh, no supervision, no regulation policies. And we're saying to them, the party is over. And uh, all of that has to change. And if it's going to change from the standpoint of this legislation, it has to be bipartisan. And that's why we are trying to work together in a bipartisan way to improve what the secretary sent. What, what the secretary sent us on, we didn't get this paper until Saturday to see what they were actually proposing. And there was such an expansive uh, uh, power for the secretary that it was almost laughable. I mean, nobody in our country should have that power, for, um, exempted from judicial review, exempted from any uh, um, a right, uh, any other independent agency of government looking into what, what they were doing. Money would be uh, that was made from this would go to the discretion of the secretary. The list goes on and on, and uh, and so so I mean we had problems with the basic outline of it to begin with. Questions about whether this would work. Concerns about the size uh, of the money. So they have. Uh, they have to improve this enormously to get any Democratic votes, and they're not going to get a, a bill on the floor unless they have Republican votes. We are not taking ownership of this issue. But you can know, you understand why the conservative blogs, right-wing blogs, would be saying this because they're trying to disassociate themselves from President Bush on this and, and um, pin the tail on our donkey uh, of this proposal, and they're just not going to do that. We're responsible. We know there has to be an intervention. Uh, it has to have certain standards uh, to be met for us to do it. We need questions answered. Uh, and, and, uh, and I think, uh, quite frankly, that members of the Republican caucus have many of the same concerns as the Democrats have on this, and that hopefully we'll be able to um, come to terms with it. And if, we, if, if they're not going to vote for it, we're not going to vote. Speaker Pelosi, one final quick, quick question for you, uh, which is what all of our this viewers are asking, asking, which is, hey, how come whenever there's uh, time for war or time to bail out Wall Street, there's always the money for it? But if we have an emergency like 43 million people uninsured in this country and everybody paying too much for health care, we can't ever get the money for it. That's because we have a Republican president, and that's what that's going to change on November 4th. So we should all channel our energies to elect Barack Obama, the next president of the United States. As I said to one of my members today, remember May? Well, that seems like yesterday in some respects. So, And January is only that far away uh, when it will all be different about what our 
priorities are, what our policies are, of course, and what our priorities are in our, in our investments of our taxpayer dollars. So, uh, you know, it, we just have to work very hard to change that because if we have a four more years of these policies, I really am very concerned about uh, how our country will fare. And that, and that the question that they're asking is a legitimate one, one we ask each other all the time. Why, um, uh, on brink of disaster every time, uh, uh, do we have to uh, allocate resources away from uh, the needs of the American people? And now in this case, to, to meet the um, deregulation and lack of supervision on the part of this administration in relationship to their friends on Wall Street. The party is over for them. And now let's make their, their uh, presidency over to uh, on November 4th. Speaker of the House. I'm going to have to go now because we have to go back to work here. <laughs> but thank you very much. Thank I hope we can continue this conversation. Thank you so much for joining us, Speaker. We really appreciate it. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. All right, guys, we're going to come right back and we're going to talk to our bloggers. Uh, meet the bloggers. We'll be uh, back in a minute. This brave nation was founded by those who went against the grain, by people who saw the need for change and stood up. Join us for a series of conversations with people making a difference. Tell us about the young people who are making tomorrow's changes. This Brave Nation at bravenation.com. All right, guys, welcome back to this special edition of Meet the Bloggers. Now let's meet our bloggers. Uh, joining us today, Roberto Lovato. He blogs at Of America. He's written that this financial meltdown has ushered in a new era of top-down socialism. I couldn't agree more with that. I want to come back and talk about that in just a little bit. Uh, but also joining us, Matt Iglesias. He's a senior editor at the Center for American Progress. His blog is part of Think Progress. Matt advocates limiting executive pay in the bailed out banks to a government pay scale. That's an interesting idea. And questions whether the bank bailout is, quote, genuinely needed or just merely desired. Matt, I want to start with that. Uh, I have my doubts, as you might have heard in the last segment. How do we know that this thing is genuinely needed, especially when it's going to cost us $700 billion? Yeah, I mean, it's clear that something or other has to be done to get credit markets operating again. But, you know, one suspects that of all the possible things that could be done, that what Paulson came up with is just sort of what, you know, people he knows from his investment banking days would like to see happen. It's, it's a plan that's as favorable to them as possible. Uh, when you're talking about spending $700 billion to solve a problem, th that's a ton of money. Normally, if I say, here, I've got a great solution, it'll cost $700 billion, you know, people on the Hill would say, well, no, that's not a real solution at all. That, that's too much money. But, you know, if Hank Paulson says, if President Bush says, well, we can spend $700 billion fixing the economy, then that opens up a lot of possibilities, a lot of different things you could do with that much money. And we ought to be exploring all the different options here, not just the ones that are sort of best for Goldman Sachs. Yeah, Matt, I want to follow up on that real quick, because I remember uh, they said, look, look at September 11th. We had a real emergency. Hence, we must invade Iraq. And those two things were not connected. So now we have a real emergency, and they say, hence, we must give $700 billion to these Wall Street executives. I, I, I don't, I'm not sure I see the connection. Well, exactly. And, and you know, uh, Senator Chuck Schumer, who, you know, of course, represents New York, is close to Wall Street and is not not hostile to the interests of Wall Street. He was asking uh, yesterday uh, on the Hill, he was asking Paulson, you know, well, why do we need to give you all seven hundred billion dollars? Can't we give you one hundred fifty billion dollars and sort of see how that goes? And then the new president can reevaluate this plan in January. 
And, you know, I certainly think that whatever it is we do, it shouldn't disgorge that much money and it shouldn't pre-commit the next president to doing anything in particular in 2009. You want to do you want to spend as much money as we need to spend, you know, in the month of October and September to prevent things from seizing up in the short term. But it would be good to sort of revisit this after the election, have the president elect and the lame duck Congress work out what they want to do, let a new administration have an important role in shaping this and also, you know, see if we're being effective at all. All right, you know, I want to go to what uh, Matt just mentioned there. Roberto, uh, you know, this, can, this kind of power also gets transferred to the next president, and that might be Barack Obama, but it very well might be John McCain, and his Treasury Secretary might be Phil Graham, the guy who started this mess in the first place. So imagine Phil Graham with $700 billion of our money to spread around. I mean, when you look at it that way, do you say to this, no deal under any of these circumstances? Definitely, Cenk. Uh, I think we need to say no deal to Paulson's uh, proposal. I think we need to look at the current crisis as we look at any other crisis, whether it's a geopolitical crisis or our family crisis. There's always an opportunity in this. And there's an opportunity to get things right for once in our lives, in our political and our personal lives, because the stakes are high. Uh, Joseph Stiglitz, Nobel Prize winning economist, said that the fall of Wall Street is for market fundamentalism, what the fall of the Berlin Wall was for communism. And we have to see that in this term. We have to fundamentally change this decrepit, corrupt system. And it's not just our economic system, but our political system that is at risk when, for example, you have uh, Paulson's proposal calling for, in Section 8, quote, uh, that the Secretary's decisions are non-reviewable and committed to agency discretion and may not be reviewed by any court of law or any administrative agency. That's, that amounts to economic dictatorship and the abolition of democracy. So it's an economic and a political problem that, of unprecedented proportions. And people are comparing this to the Great Depression because it is giving birth to a certain kind of top-down socialism. So we have to be weary. You know, it's funny, and there's a great irony here, Roberto, because i got to be honest with you, you're one of the most liberal people I know. And here you are arguing against top-down <laughs> socialism, you know? And, and, and this is, it's true. I mean, when you look at this thing, it, it is socialism, but for the rich, isn't it? Yeah, and, uh, you know, none of the debate, for example, includes uh, uh, the poor. When we talk about Main Street, we're leaving out uh, Cesar Chavez Boulevard and uh, Martin Luther King Avenue and other working class areas across this country. The people that don't own homes, the people that rent, the people that are struggling to survive with two, sometimes even three jobs are completely silent in this. Silence, the lack of democracy are a surefire uh, call for people up top, Democrat and Republican, to start repression, which is what we saw right after the Great Depression and most other uh, crisis in this country's economic and political history. It's a scary time. Well, you know, I think Roberto's right, Matt. I, I, I'm almost thinking about grabbing my pitchfork. And there is anger here, not just on the liberal or progressive side, but on the conservative side, too. We're all angry because we're all getting screwed in this. Because it's our money that they're going to take to bail out guys who made a tremendous amount of money last year and the year before and the year before and the year after. You know they're going to make just as much money the, the, the next year. So as you look at this thing, what is the right solution? I think giving them the money under Paulson's plan is a no deal, no way. But how do we really deal with this? What do we do instead to make this situation tenable so that we can actually have markets that work, but at the same time don't give away taxpayer money? Well, you know, I mean, one question is, what do we do in the short term? What do we do to get the credit markets rolling again? And I think what the speaker was talking about uh, in terms of, you know, doing a bailout, but a bailout that preserves an upside for the taxpayer so that if it works, you know, we get the money back instead of the financiers getting the money. You, you know that that's right. Uh, but then there's a there's a longer term. There's a structural question, right? I mean, if we'd looked back two years ago and said, you know, well, wh why not have 
much, much higher taxes, you know, on, on these guys and say, well, you know, we need to encourage work and investment and so on and so forth. Uh, but w we really need to ask ourselves, I mean, wh why had the financial services industry become so profitable? Why did it become such a large share of economic activity in the United States when on some level it seems to have been based on, you know, at best incompetence, at worst fraud and criminality, right? I mean, we don't just want to say, well, we're going to have stricter oversight in the future. You know, you, you need to have stricter oversight, but I think you really need to think about, about the structure of this. I mean, why so many of the, of the top college graduates would go to work for these investment banking firms because there was so much money in it. We were creating strong financial incentives for everyone to sort of get into finance, get into hedge funds, get into private equity, get into investment banking. And for what? You know, I mean, what, what value exactly was being created here? Why can't we try to, you know, redistribute that money into the real economy, so to speak, where people are working and, and selling things and making things? It, it, Roberta, I got a quick question for you before we wrap up here. Hank Paulson has $500 million uh, that he took out of Goldman Sachs when he came to the Treasury. Uh, we don't really know where that $500 million is. They say it's in a blind trust although I read an article saying that uh, he knows a lot of it is in Goldman Sachs. Is it legitimate to question Hank Paulson's interest here and that he might actually be concerned about his own half a billion dollars that he's got in a bank somewhere? Yeah, I think we need to look at who Hank Paulson is. And you have somebody who's hardly a communist like Gretchen uh, Morganson at the editor financial uh, section of the, edit of the New York Times telling us that he and Bernanke have quote, very little integrity, that they, quote, lied to us back in 2007 when they said they were going to limit this to the subprime and that they were almost out of this. Surely somebody like that who hasn't had the integrity to tell the truth about the global situation probably has some personal interest. But I, I don't even think the personal interests of Paulson are, are a matter at this point. The main focus right now is that we need to look at these people as the same people that stole the elections, the same people that took us into a war that was an absolute lie, the same people that lied to us about the subprime, the same people that are now leading us into economic and perhaps political dictatorship. Um, we get urgent about this. There you have it. Uh, Roberto and Matt, we really appreciate you guys joining us. That's all the time we have for today. Thank you for joining us today. And now, guys, we got to take uh, uh, leave of you, uh, but don't worry. We will be back, and we'll be back on Friday at our regular time at 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific. And we're going to talk about uh, physical and mental health records of both candidates should they release them. So uh, until then, do something, and we'll meet you at meetthebloggers.org on Friday.